Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, eminent panelists, students, uh, as we all know that today world is observing the uh, 6th International Day of Women and Girls in Science uh, with the team of women scientists at the forefront of fighting COVID-19. Uh, at the ComStech, which is Ministerial Standing Committee on Scientific and Technological Cooperation of the OIC, in Pakistan, uh, we are fully committed to promote uh, and support women scientists. Uh, for this, we conduct lots of uh, diverse kind of activities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we all agree that uh, the global pandemic has affected uh, virtually everyone on the face of the earth. So the good news is throughout the pan uh, pandemic, women scientists have been actively involved and participated in researches being conducted for uh, whether it is testing, identification of the virus, its genome, and vaccine production, treatment, etc. But certainly it has affected the women scientists adversely also, because uh, especially the early career women scientists, uh, because of uh, limited scope of growth, limited mobility, limited funding opportunities, and uh, of course, the household responsibility, which we call work for home and work from home simultaneously. In this connection, this panel discussion was very important so that we can learn from the, uh, from the uh, champions in the field. So we have very eminent panelists today. And without taking much of your time, uh, uh, I would request my colleague uh, Khazima at the Comstech headquarters uh, to introduce us with today's uh, panelists. Thank you, Kazima. What do you mean? Your mic is mute. Oh, again, so sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hina. Uh, we are very delighted and to and honored to have uh, you know our guest speakers today for this uh, panel discussion. We have uh, with us Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhry. Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhry is coordinator general Comstech and director ICCBS. Uh, we have Professor Dr. Khadija Yusuf. Dr. Khadija Yusuf uh, is basically served as deputy uh, deputy chair for the University of Uttar Malaysia. And um, Dr. Rana Dajani. Dr. Rana Dajani is a visiting faculty for a number of institutes including Yale, Cambridge, and Harvard. We have Dr. Professor Dr. Tim Unwin. Professor Dr. Tim Unwin is basically from University of London and is a founder of Tech Together. And with us, we are very delighted and pleased to have Dr. Sumbula Farooq with us. Dr. Sumbula Farooq is from Tübingen University in, Uni in Germany. And with this brief intro, I would like to invite and request Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhry, Coordinator General Comstech and Director ICCBS to start this panel discussion. Over to you, sir. Azubillah, Yunusha, my team. Good morning, uh, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen from different time zones. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this very important event, which is uh, indeed uh, a part of a, of a global uh, day and uh, on a very important topic in some of the most difficult times of human history. Uh, I travel almost this morning, so I may not really be that coherent because uh, uh, I had uh, so much of traveling in, in uh, recent days. Uh, but what I was discussing with my colleagues yesterday in National Defense University, that uh, never in the history of humanity sign any, uh, any discipline of human endeavor has been deployed to that level. Science has been deployed uh, with amazing speed. And what we have uh, seen science emerge as savior of humanity. You know, from uh, uh, early, early uh, diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 in December, to its publication of genome in Open Science Journal, from development of diagnostics mm -hmm. to repurposing, mm -hmm. all, uh, all have been an extremely amazing journey of uh, development. And I think if any one discipline which has uh, developed more trust and expectation, and this is science. 
Eventually, within 11 months, we had uh, over 170 different vaccines in uh, different phases of development. And think of it, uh, if science wasn't there, what was the condition of humanity at this point in time also? By all projection, you can simply see that uh, this uh, uh, magic number of 70% of natural uh, herd immunity, 5 billion people had to be infected to, uh, to achieve that. And with the death rate of about 1%, 50 million people had to die. And 150 billion, uh, 1.5 billion people had to live with comorbidities. And you know, think of it how this healthcare system and economies uh, had to handle all these crises. This was only science which responded with amazing speed. This was only science which has fulfilled the promise as a result of his science emerge as the winner, uh, winner for everyone. Science, which has not really thought of uh, any profiteering or anything like this. If uh, science wasn't there, we were not in a position to discuss with each other this important pandemic and its impact on, uh, on women. And you see, I mean, I was absolutely amazed to see frontline uh, front health workers, doctors, medics, nurses, uh, all were just so bravely involved in handling this pandemic. But the difference between uh, man and woman was that, uh, you see, we have seen nurses uh, crying on, on sufferings of people, this empathy, this connection with humanity is such a unique feature of, uh, of women that really make them so different and so special and, uh, and so important. So we have seen uh, at every forefront, so not only they were in this historical struggling uh, struggle of saving the humanity and world, but they were at the same time in the struggle of uh, saving the families. So they have this dual role of saving the world and saving the humanity. But at the end of the day, what you see is just absolutely heartbreaking. You know, you see them suffering because they were the one who lost most job. They were the one who uh, suffered in terms of their scientific career and professional growth. They were uh, the one who uh, have actually become so disadvantaged uh, from research funding publications. Publication. Literally everything in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the world uh, and uh, put them on such a disadvantaged position. And I was just absolutely amazed when I've uh, seen this quote of Melinda Gates when she said, all existing inequalities in the world uh, become so uh, so prominent in the time of pandemic, whether it's uh, social injustice or racial inequalities or gender biases and that we have seen in this world also. So, uh, so uh, one thing which you need to understand that uh, we are still in COVID world. I don't think we would come out of it. We, this would remain be with us for years and uh, we have to we have to see what actually happening uh, with our girls, you know, uh, in our cultures. We live in uh, in poor region in many countries of uh, of the south, global south. Uh, you, you know, uh, people suffered a lot. Uh, there is widespread unemployment. There is a, a you know low family income, and who would uh, face the uh, the problem? You know who would suffer? Uh, this female child would suffer. You know, if uh, parents have a choice of sending one child to the school, that would always be a male child. You know, this is what our culture is, unfortunately. If they have to feed a one a child properly, the the, the girl child would be malnourished. malnourished. You no, know, so there's so many things actually happening, and we fully do not really understand. The, the impact of this, we talk about economies, we have, you know, we talk about melting down economies, we talk about uh, uh, 
you know, regional cooperation, we talk about size diplomacy, we talk about mega things. But the fact is that one mega thing which we don't uh, fully comprehend is impact on women and impact on their contribution in the scientific world and impact on their education and impact on their future. And this is all about, I think this is what this uh, wonderful uh, uh, group of panelists, some of the finest, brightest people I ever met are going to discuss this. And we are so delighted that Comstack uh, is hosting it. Uh, Comstack is a forum which is mandated to promote science and technology for all. And uh, this is exactly the forum where we need to have affirmative action, where we need to take uh, that into a global agenda. We have included this in the speech of the president of Pakistan in the next science and technology summit in UAE. We made sure that this uh, uh, important issue is highlighted at the highest summit forum in the OIC region. We'll make sure that uh, we keep highlighting this because this is very close to our heart. This affects uh, our sisters, this affects our daughters, this affects our family members who are uh, as bright, even no, if not more brighter than us. Thank you very much for being part of this absolutely important and intellectually st stimulating exercise. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with this, we will move on to our next speaker, Professor Dr. Khadija Yusuf. Let me introduce to her, uh, to you all. Dr. Khadija Yusuf is the first woman being elected as a Deputy Vice Chancellor for the Academic and International Affairs at University of Khotra, Malaysia. She worked for the Office of Science Advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia, establishing National Science and Research Council National Bioethics Council and National Institutes of Biotechnology. She has been elected as a Fellow of Acad Academy of Sciences Malaysia in two 2007, a Fellow of Islamic World Academy of Sciences in 2008, and the World Academy of Sciences in 2010. She's been the second Asian scientist ever to win UNESCO Carlos Pelle Prize in 2005 for her outstanding work in the field of virology. She is highly respected academician and her work is much acclaimed on the on New, Newcastle disease virus. With this, I would like, uh, like to invite Dr. Khadija Yusuf for her presentation and talk today. Dr. Khadija. Thank you, Khazima. <laughs> Salam alaikum. And I would say good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. And I was delighted to participate in this webinar. Thank you, Comstat, for inviting me. I'd like to start with um, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. It has definitely disrupted almost everyone's lives. The worst impacts of the coronavirus will undoubtedly be the loss of lives and livelihood, the collapse of economies, the disruption of humanitarian aid and the disruption uh, to human aspirations and much more. Worldwide, as universities are locked down, labs closed, uh, the standard funding and publishing pipelines also slowed down or shifted to other priorities. Research, in particular, is very, very much hit. These affect almost all scientists, especially amongst the early career women, especially those in the developing countries or least developed countries where support for remote learning and working tends to be less than sporadic. Women scientists with young children seem to be most affected by the pandemic with added home responsibilities that make working from home a greater challenge than for men. Like Kazima said just now, you have not only to work from home, but you have to work for home. I would like to present my experience during the pandemic as an academic, as a professor in microbiology. I would also share the results of a survey done last year by the Organization of Women in Science for the Developing World, OWSD, involving nearly 1,500 respondents from over 85 countries. 
this survey explored how the pandemic has changed their work or studies. What challenges have they faced and what have been the consequences of these challenges? But also what upsides have there been to the disruption in routine? And have they participated in response to the pandemic themselves? Perhaps the most significant um, effect during the lockdown is the closure or limited uh, opening of our research labs. At the same time, the available working hours were limited by other competing household chores and childcare responsibilities. In my opinion, the main aspects that are affected most are the relationship between our colleagues and peers, as the usual free direct exchange of the ideas is missing. We are not able to effectively interact, get help or receive opinions from our colleagues and peers who are present at different times in the lab. Science requires this. We Physical distancing definitely restricts this necessary stimulus. Scientists working in different disciplines may be affected differently and unevenly. It is not surprising the research time in those fields that require physical labs and instruments has slid down to nearly 40%. Those areas that are less dependent on instruments, such as mathematics, computer sciences, statistics, economics, humanities, seem to be less affected. In fact, many have reported to have had more time available for their research and thus have increased their scientific output and publications. And that was what Tim said to me just now in our earlier conversation. My students and I have experienced rather severe challenges in carrying out our research. Often than not, the campus is open to those staying either in the colleges or within a certain parameter to the campus. In Kuala Lumpur, it is 10 kilometers. Not everyone has access to the lab. There is also difficulty in receiving research materials for our experiments. The amount of time allowed in the lab is also limited due to the current SOPs. What about clinical research, which often requires in-person involvement? Although we can circumvent the situation by various social media platforms, the participants may not always be willing or available to embrace this new way of communicating or they may not have the necessary capabilities to get onto the platform. Deferring participant, uh, participant enrollment or follow-up may be an alternative, but this may delay the study or affect the study protocol, which may have impact on the outcome. Furthermore, Hospitals and clinics tend to discourage patients attending outpatient clinics where these clinical trials are often conducted and discourage research assistance from going into the community. Due to the prolonged lockdowns, research activities and milestones get delayed, requiring time extension. I find that lockdowns can be very, very expensive, especially for my lab. Most often, when a lockdown is announced, we have a day to round up our research activities. That means we have to abandon some of our experiments halfway through the research. Starting all over again means that we need extra time to re-establish our experiments, which doubles the cost for consumables. Delay in getting the data means a delay in getting our publications and to many of us, a setback in reaching our KPIs set by the university. The closure of campuses also affects our teaching. 
Some may argue that we, we can replace face-to-face -face with online teaching. Having many online teaching tools available does not guarantee that there is equitable accessibility to the internet amongst not only the students, but also the lecturers. This lack of a reliable internet connection to many has made effective work from home very, very difficult. This can also be challenging when there are several users requiring not only the computer or laptop at home, but also the space to carry on with the online meetings. There is even more pronounced, this is even more pronounced with those having to home tutor their children in homeschooling. The lack of a stable internet connection is also very challenging when online exams are being connected, uh, conducted. I'm sure many of you have experienced this. What do we do when the internet is disconnected during the examination? In addition, how do we prevent our students from cheating? They can easily Google the answers and do a cut and paste job. We are still trying uh, new tricks to ensure that there is no cheating. And what about the lab classes? We try our best to adjust the curriculum, but there are times when it is necessary for students to have face-to-face -face lab work. We have to be innovative and change the way we teach lab classes and improvise to conduct some experiments at home. For example, our students can do DNA extraction using soap, salt, and what do you know? hand sanitizers. There are also advantages that we face uh, or that we can get during this uh, pandemic. There is more flexibility in time management, thus allowing getting more done. We can attend virtual meetings, courses, workshops to expand our professional skills. More time can be given to keeping up to date with the literature and we save travel time as we save travel time during commuting through the horrible traffic jams. In addition, we can even improve our networking. I find that many of my students who tend to be shy to ask questions in the usual face-to-face -face classroom tend to be more vocal online, uh, which promotes deeper uh, learning. There is no doubt <clears throat> the importance of sharing data, publications, and creating online collaborative platforms through open science. This has helped to accelerate the pace of research critical to combating the pandemic. For example, the full genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus was established, was published by Lancet in February 2020 as an open access publication. In less than a year, we are able to design, develop, roll out the COVID-19 vaccines. Remarkable. While global sharing of research data and research collaboration has reached unprecedented levels, challenges do remain. Trust in at least some of the data is relatively low and outstanding issues include lack of specific standards and coordination as well as data quality and interpretation. For example, the different interpretation of data on COVID-19 itself concerning confirmed cases, death and recoveries, they are different. Each of these items seem to be treated differently in different countries and sometimes even subjected to methodological changes within the same country. We have a lot of issues on this. Excuse me. God. Yes, uh, Dr. Yusuf. Uh, can you hear us, Dr. Yusuf? I, uh, sorry, my battery went off, okay. um, but I can't see you. Um, where, where did I stop? Just a minute. Sure. 
Slide number 11, Dr. Khadija. Wait, wait, but I can't see. Um, I don't seem to be able to see you. Shit. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. I'll, how do I do this? Um, I'm on slide number 11, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can see it because I can't see anything. My, my screen is already gone blank. Uh, we can, can see you your see slides. slides. Yeah, Thank we can see your slides, but uh, you have to put them on uh, slide mode. Yeah, but I can't even see anything on my my, my computer screen has gone blank, black. Right. Okay, so, I'll just go on. Uh, and can you just um, tell me when I, I need to change, I'll change, okay? Okay, fine. Um, okay, I'm slide seven, uh, 11 now. To no, we can... Can you see? I can't see. No, uh, we cannot see your slide. What you can do is you can email me your slides if that's okay to oh. you. No, uh, we can, can see your slide. We can see your slide. Dr. Khadija, why don't you uh, just uh, go offline and sign in again, maybe that will have help. Okay. Um, you, you can leave and then come in again. But I can't see, but my whole computer's gone uh, kaput. Uh, but can you... Hello? Yes, you're on uh, slide 11 also, now. Uh, you, but, but would you please press B? Press B? B, but the alphabet B. Possibly it has gone blank. P. B, B, B for burnt. B. Yeah. B, nothing happens, command B? Yeah, no, no, just B. Nothing happens. Yeah. Nothing happens. Okay, but can I right. go on? Because time is running. Yes, you can go on, please. You can go on. Can, That's all right. Uh, we okay. can hear from you, but it is your inconvenience. Anyway, let's move oh. on. Dr. Z uh, Dr. Zahid, can you see her slides? Because we can I see can. her slides. Yes, I can, I, my, I can see her slides. Okay, great. Okay. Dr. Khadija, yes, okay. please go on. Okay, to strengthen the contribution of open science to the COVID-19 response, Policy makers need to ensure adequate data governance, more uh, standards and sustainable uh, data sharing agreements, as well as mechanisms for access to data across borders. Next slide, please. Women scientists are very resilient. We have overcome all the numerous barriers to pursue careers in STEM related fields. According to UNESCO, less than 30% of scientific researchers worldwide are women, and only around 30% of these select STEM-related fields in higher education. Difficulties in balancing family life and work have a big role in women opting out of scientific career paths. We have to attend our children's online school activities, plus cooking and cleaning the house, and the responsibility of caring for the old and sick relatives in addition to the activities required in having a full-time job as an academic in higher education. This can be very trying, although being at home allows us to spend more time with our children and bring the family together. The OWSD survey showed that 83% of the respondents spend more time with their families. This improved relationship with their children and improved relationship with their partner. Some even said that they enjoyed being actively involved in the children's educations. There are many women scientists who are involved with some kind of response to COVID-19, both through research and in the translation of research to clinical responses, policy and public communication. About 4% of the OWSD respondents are performing research directly on the COVID-19 virus itself, while 14% are performing research on other activities, uh, other effects of the pandemic, like impact on other health conditions, societal or economic impact. A larger number are participating in raising awareness or disseminating information about the disease and 8% are involved with coordinating policy response to COVID-19 at the institutional level. So what can be done to minimize the impact of COVID-19? 
it is indeed very important that we have clear strategies on career, in particular on leadership. We should have mechanisms for extensions of deadlines and be flexible with our team members. The institution should also invest in new technologies for online teaching and research. We need to relook at promotion exercises and KPIs. The inability to carry out research in the lab means lesser publication numbers for our promotion or tenureship. The earlier career scientists with young children may be at a disadvantage competing with the other researchers and hence there will be less chance in getting promoted. In order to help mitigate the situation, the institution should invest in childcare facilities for the young scientists. The COVID-19 pandemic can also be a game changer. We need to set a right balance between science, family and rules imposed by the COVID-19 emergency. Yes, we face a lot of challenges and you can see the challenge that I'm facing right now. We have to juggle between working online with the household chores and added responsibilities in childcare and schooling, as well as in delivering online teaching and assessment. Although university is supportive in, by improving the internet support and various apps, we need to be resilient and raise our emotional uh, intelligence for performance, well-being and happiness in life. We need to empower ourselves for a work-life balance that is meaningful and achievable. So I'd like to end my talk with greetings from the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. We are celebrating today the International Women's Day for Science. Thank you. Hello? Dr. Sadeja, uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we are very so sorry to our participants that we had this IT glitch, but I guess things happen. So with this, yeah. we will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Tim Unwin. Uh, let me introduce you uh, to him. Dr. Tim Unwin is the co-founder of Tech Together, an initiative to change men's attitudes and behaviors toward women and technology. He is the chair of intellectual leadership team of the DFID and World Bank Technology for Education Hub. He's a distinguished Fellow of Globalization, Aging, Innovation, and Care Network at University of Netherlands. With this, I would uh, welcome Dr. Tim for his talk. Thank you very much indeed, Kazima. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, it's a huge privilege for an uh, elderly white male from Europe uh, to be speaking amongst such a distinguished gathering of young, uh, extremely able scientists from uh, the Islamic world. So thank you for asking me. Uh, we're running a bit late, so I will try and shorten uh, what I have to say to, to enable us to have lots of questions and contributions. Uh, there were four questions in this panel session that were to be addressed. Uh, because of time constraints, I'm just going to focus on two. And I want to, I think, uh, I recognize very much what Professor Dr. Katisha has just said, but I'm going to try and be more upbeat and more positive. And I just say very briefly about the contributions of women scientists during the pandemic but also focus on uh, policy shifts that will increase uh, women's participation in STEM decision-making. And in doing this, I, I'm drawing uh, really on two bits of work that we've done. One was a, a, a major review of education using technology uh, during uh, COVID, what we've learned from that about creating resilient education systems uh, for the future. And the other is work that uh, I did this time last year, actually, uh, with colleagues uh, at uh, the Inter-Islamic Network on IT and Comsat University in Islamabad about uh, how men need to change uh, if we're gonna support our sisters across the world in STEM. Um, so all the guys on, on, on this call, uh, please take note uh, and, and uh, we need to be involved and I'll make that case for the work that we're doing at Tech Together. Um, so uh, very briefly, I think it's terribly important to recognize that uh, across the Islamic world, there are uh, huge numbers of young uh, women scientists eager to contribute. And, and this is just a picture from some of those we were working with uh, at the um, Royal Pindi Women University. Uh, and, and it's a real privilege to learn from them about the challenges that they're facing. Some of what we're gonna say is based on that. 
Um, but let me uh, just try and emphasize uh, yeah, there are many successful women in COVID science uh, across the world. And drawing on my own country, we can see uh, academics here like Sarah Gilbert, who has very much driven the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca um, vaccine. And if it wasn't for COVID, actually people like her wouldn't have such a, an important profile. And this does a huge amount for uh, championing women in science. Young women uh, can look to her and say, wow, I can be that. And in complete contrast, take uh, an early career academic, uh, one in whom I have a special interest because she's my daughter, but she's been working on uh, modeling COVID at Imperial and, and actually featured in, in, in a set of profiles of sort of eight young people uh, doing just different jobs across the world and how COVID uh, was impact them in, in our The Times newspaper. But, but just to reinforce a couple of things, she was the only English woman at undergraduate level studying mechanical engineering in the course that she was doing. Everyone else was male or there were a small number of women from elsewhere. And yet she, she did her PhD in computer science, mathematics, uh, the interface with engineering, and is now actually leading the Imperial College team uh, on modeling uh, COVID in the US, but doing other work as well. So, you know, COVID has given her the opportunity um, to, to have experiences that, that you know, she would never have believed early in her career like this. So she was working with um, Governor Cuomo's team uh, in New York, modeling their COVID practice. So I, I want to, I, I accept everything that uh, Professor Dr. Katish has just said, but let's also see that COVID has enabled a lot of young women working in this sphere to, to have opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have had. Turning now to the necessary policy shifts, um, I, I would just make two introductory points here. The first is that, as we've heard uh, in, in the previous talk, digital tech is important, but we must remember we must remember that digital technology will lead to greater inequalities unless those are mitigated. Those who have will benefit much more than those who don't. If there are inequalities in a society, such as uh, different privileges to men and women, uh, then digital tech will increase that. And I think a, a second point, and, and the, the, here, this, this is and one that I've uh, come to learn really in the last five years since I've been doing more work, uh, particularly in Pakistan, but cultural context remains. Hello, sorry, cultural, no, uh, cultural context remains really important. And, and I feel very strongly that, that particularly around gender and tech, uh, some of the Western models no, 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 about the no, way no, no, in which uh, somebody no, else no, 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 Omar, Omar Asafiri, thank you. Um, so basically, uh, some of the standard arguments about gender and tech, which are mainly drawn from uh, Western academics, uh, I don't think they necessarily apply across the world. So again, Katija, you were making the point about cultural specificity being important. Um, so uh, very briefly, uh, we did this report on education for the most marginalized, how governments can change to have more resilient education systems uh, that are fairer and based on principles of equity. Um, there's no time to go into that in detail, but one of the aspects that we drew out was what needs to be done if girls and women are going to benefit uh, from digital technology as much as their, their brothers are. And, and you can follow this up on our um, icdfd.org.uk site. We're coming up with a, with a set of clear objectives and, and interestingly, this was written before um, much of the COVID work had, 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 had developed. But one of the key items in that is we've got to, for example, have women champions, make sure that textbooks have women scientists in them, not just male scientists. And, and I, I, I reflect on some interesting research that was done uh, in, in by, by a group um, headed up by uh, Kentaro Toyama in India a few years ago, which said that actually in, in India, unlike, for example, in my own country in the UK, uh, science and engineering, uh, computer science, mathematics are very popular for young women. But that's because uh, that is seen as being a highly desirable uh, skill set to have for when they get married. And when they get married, they then leave science. Although there are many young women studying at university, they don't go on through into the tech sector. But let me now turn to uh, girl power um, and, and turn to 
uh, the other side, the work that we're doing in tech together. And again, last year, about this time when I was when I was working um, at the University of Sindh in Jamshoro, uh, this young woman I saw on the back of her phone, uh, the, this 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 wonderful case, girl power. And that's what we're talking about. How do we make a difference? And as I said earlier, um, again, learning from from these young women. Uh, much of the literature, and, and Katija, hearing you talking about you know, women empowering themselves, much of the literature is about that. But if their brothers, if their fathers, if their husbands don't support them in that endeavour, particularly in societies uh, that, that tend to have male dominance within the sector, um, then we're not going to make much difference. So the case I want to put to you all now today is that, yes, we must support our sisters in what they're doing, but we need to change men's attitudes and behaviors to, to women uh, and uh, tech and STEM if they are going to uh, benefit to the, the maximum they can. And, and, and part of this research was done, as I said, last year in Pakistan with, with uh, not only women in universities, uh, but men and women in, in tech startups. And I, I just want to sort of uh, emphasize this point again about context. Uh, in much of the world, uh, tech is very male dominated. Um, and and, and you, know, you say, is this image here? Um, you know, tech market in, 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 in Wolf India again. Um, is that a very friendly environment to women, for example? Women in senior jobs, my daughter, being the only woman studying mechanical engineering as an undergraduate, we have a male dominated. Therefore, men have a responsibility to do something about it. I think uh, another yeah, simple thing, but if we're going to make policy changes, we have to take these into consideration, is that much of the South Asian tech sector, for example, is based on outsourcing to the USA. So if their people in the sector are going to be working with colleagues in the USA, they have to be up at night. But as we've heard so eloquently uh, from, from Dr. Khadija, that women have responsibilities at home. So, and, and, and their brothers and husbands are often afraid if they're traveling at night in the dark. So just a simple thing like the nature of the economy has important ramifications for the position of women. And of course, as we've touched on already, there are cultural expectations of gender roles. So out of the work we did in talking uh, last year, uh, and, and these were things that we hadn't thought of in all the work and the guidance notes we'd done in Tech Together before, uh, two important things, our sisters and, and, and the men who we interviewed as well, who were committed to making the changes. We need advice and policies for uh, CEOs of SMEs and, and other companies, those in the tech sector, dare I say it, those in universities who wish to employ women in STEM. Some, and, and many of the men are eager to do so, but they're not sure what they need to do to change. So we've done a guidance note on that. And also something that came through very clearly is brothers matter. If we're going to empower women in science, their brothers at home must help to do that. And, and I just want to, um, there's not time to go into more detail, but the example of the, uh, uh, the tips we've done, and these are very simple guidance things. You know, here we had 10 things for CEOs, um, and, and, and you can get download this in uh, Urdu and, and, and in English um, off our site, which is just simply techtogether.org. Uh, there's no time to go into detail because I started a little bit late, but, but the one I just want to think of is tips for brothers to support their sisters in STEM. And, and simple things like this, yeah, Men are the one who cause a lot of abuse and harm online. So brothers, you know, we're men, help our sisters learn more about how to use tech safely. Um, and, and, and another very, very simple thing here. Um, you know, we spoke with a lot of women who said, no, I can't actually do the tech. Um, I'll get my brother to do it. But, but hey, brothers, men, fathers, help your sister learn to do it herself. Don't always do it for her. So there are a lot of tips here, a lot of exciting things. I could talk for hours on this as, as you've gathered. Um, I hope Kazima, we've caught up a bit on time. Um, and so we're now almost back on schedule, uh, but I'm very happy to follow up. I, I think just a couple of takeaways. Uh, you know, we need policies uh, at a national and strategic level, but we also need practical tips and advice. And every man, Every man on this call, afterwards, think about what you can do as an individual for every woman in your life to help her uh, develop her expertise and liberate her in the world of STEM. We have a responsibility. We can't just leave it to our sisters to empower themselves. So thank you very much. Once again, I will go back into my panel here. Uh, it's a privilege to be with such a wonderful group of people. 
Thank you, Comstec, for inviting me, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Dr. Tim. Uh, Tim, thank you very much, and thank you for actually, you know, sort of uh, compre uh, giving your presentation in a very comprehensive manner for the sake of time as well. Uh, we would, uh, I would request my participants to please uh, post your questions in the chat box so that once we have the question answer session, we can take as many questions as possible. Uh, and with this, I will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Rana Dajani. Dr. Rana Dajani is Professor of Molecular Cell Biology at Jordan. She's the visiting professor at Yale, Cambridge, and Harvard. She was, uh, she's the most uh, influential woman scientist in Islamic world. 12 among 100 most influential Arab women, president of the Society for the Advancement of Science, Technology, and Innovation in the Arab world, developed We Love Reading um, platform, changing mindset through reading to create change makers. Award. She has attended a World Innovation Summit in Education, has, has been awarded with the award for this Innovation Summit. She is also the recipient of King Hussein Medal of Honor. Uh, she is a recipient of UNESCO International Literacy Award and many other awards with this, um, you know, with this uh, very acclaimed work that she has done so far. She is known for her book, uh, Five Scarves, Doing the Impossible. And with this very brief introduction, um, I'd like to invite Dr. Rana Dajani for her talk. Dr. Rana, we are open for you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel and to uh, be amongst all these wonderful and amazing people from all over the world, from different time zones. I'm here to learn as much as everybody else uh, and uh, hopefully take all these recommendations and lessons and apply them in my own life. And I look forward to the questions as they come. So please keep them coming, especially the ones that are challenging and, and critiquing. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. So uh, the, the topic of the panel is women in the COVID uh, pandemic. And of course, the previous speakers have covered a lot of ground. And so I want to try to bring something new uh, to this conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm going to tell a number of stories. And uh, you know, as an evolutionary biologist, because evolution is in everything, we know that uh, there were at least in, in the, some millennia in the past, there were two groups of people. A group that sat around a fire and told stories and another group that frowned upon those who were telling stories, uh, uh, accusing them of wasting their time. But I think we can all agree it was the storytellers that survived. So in, in that spirit, I'm gonna share a number of stories to, to really share the messages that I've learned through this pandemic. And, and I adopted this approach, which is I think the hallmark of every scientist, which is to see what everybody sees, but to think what no one has thought. Um, and this is for you to go check who, who actually said this as a quote, he was a Nobel prize winner at some point. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is not just the, the hallmark of scientists, it's the hallmark of, of humans. It's part, of, again, why we survived. It's that curiosity, uh, that seeking beyond the frontier. So I adopted this approach in looking at this challenge of women in science, uh, women across the world. And this is before COVID and then during COVID and then planning ahead post COVID. And, and I just want to uh, highlight one point that uh, uh, Professor Tim uh, said before me, is that although the statistics around the world globally, they keep talking about less women in STEM, uh, in, in STEM education, like an undergraduate level and a graduate level. Uh, however, this, these statistics are very, um, they're an average of the whole world and they do not represent regions and nuances of every country and every culture and may be misleading. Because if I look where I am in Jordan, the number percentages of women in bachelor's degree, grad, master's and PhD is actually 60 and sometimes 70%, which is exactly the statistics I think in India. So, uh, there, so we need to unpack this uh, in order to develop better solutions that are targeted and not just uh, um, general uh, solutions that really don't address the challenges. This, this is a problem uh, of girls in STEM and education in the US, maybe in Europe, but not in other parts of the world. Uh, so to me, uh, there's something to be learned from the global South by the global North on why our girls are more interested in doing STEM. And maybe that could help uh, the global North to address that problem. However, if we go beyond in terms of career, the whole globe uh, uh, suffers from the same challenge. And if you go into, uh, to look at that problem, which is like uh, in a career, we find out from research that it are women who are married, who have children who actually drop out. 
And this is not just in STEM, but across the board. So then the question becomes why? What's happening here? What can we learn and how, what are the solutions we can develop? Uh, and uh, so, so the way I look at it is that all brains are equal, regardless, male or female. It's just the lack of opportunities uh, that are out there. And the, and the reason, uh, one of those reasons uh, for less women is not just lack of opportunity, it's also that the framework of the workplace was designed by men for men when the Industrial Revolution happened. And when women wanted to enter the workforce after the war, uh, they tried to mold themselves to fit this frame without acknowledging the differences between men and women. And those differences are not brain related, but very biologically evolutionary. A woman has a uterus, she will, she will carry a baby for nine months. She has to nurse that baby and a man does not, at least for the time being, as one male once said, but men will be pregnant at some point. And I said, when that happens, we'll deal with it. But, and we are all measured with the same measurement designed by a man. <laughs> so I think that this is where we need to pause and say, how are we different? What are our priorities? But as we do that, we want to also strike a balance uh, not to be discriminated against as a result of these, uh, these differences, these very biological differences, not related to society or culture. And, and, not, and to acknowledge that, that that period of early childhood, whether in pregnancy, in utero, or immediately after is very, very important to produce a healthy, uh, both mentally, social uh, future generation, as, as research has shown with what happens with extreme neglect uh, in, 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 uh, for children. And of course, when I talk about this, it should have both parents involved, but we all know that the role of the mother, especially in nursing and breastfeeding uh, is very, very essential in those times. So what I, what I suggest is not saying, how can we get more women into the workplace and how to get more women into STEM? Because that's assuming that we know what they want. It's changing the rhetoric and redefining success and reimagining it and, and to allow people to, uh, to uh, pursue their own passion from staying at home, taking care of children to maybe becoming a CEO and everything in between, but to be a choice uh, for those who have a choice. And of course, we must always remember those who are not privileged enough to have a choice for this. And then we would have a diversity, a diversity of what success looks like, where everybody is happy and satisfied because they are pursuing their own passion. And this does not only apply to women, but to other minority groups who are discriminated against. So if a woman in the end decides out of her own passion, her own curiosity to, to pursue this STEM uh, career, how can we help her? And why isn't she succeeding for those who have? We know that one of the biggest problems is lack of networking and connecting. And this has been mentioned by, by Professor Khadija and Professor Tim before me. Uh, lack of money to travel to connect, lack of support, uh, power dynamics. So you may have laws and regulations in place, but those who implement them are old white men. And so they don't, they don't, they interpret the laws as they want. Uh, there's the unconscious implicit bias. There's the power dynamics. Even if you have a meeting and you have quota, people uh, don't speak up, they're intimidated. And of course you have different personalities. All this comes coming together, uh, um, does not support women to network properly, connect, to share ideas, discuss and debate, to push forward their science. So this was the past and then COVID-19 hit, right? And everybody's been talking about the negative aspect of COVID-19. And of course, this is a reality we have to deal with, but I'm always the optimist. Uh, my husband says, I see an ocean in a drop of water. So I'm coming from that field. So I'm gonna be very optimistic and tell you how I see the silver lining in this. First of all, because of, and I'm gonna share part of my experience uh, and maybe um, uh, help people look at the, the COVID-19 pandemic and what we're going through in a different way. Uh, so first of all, to me, this was an opportunity to really connect with people all over the world. Uh, and that allowed me to access knowledge that I wouldn't have because I'm busy in my lab or I'm busy um, you know, doing other things, driving, like Khadija said, when now I have more time to read more literature, uh, to, to talk to people and get the knowledge from them immediately because everybody's on, on, online, to network. Otherwise, I wouldn't have reached out to these people because they wouldn't have been available. And to meet face-to-face -face on Zoom or uh, Microsoft Meeting or any one of those uh, technologies. Uh, and these are things that I would have never done at, at this rate or at this frequency in the past. And this has allowed us to create new teams, diverse teams from across the world, or even regionally or even locally that we wouldn't have because we would have only imagined that I have to drive to this place. I have to meet this professor in her or his office. I have to go to her lab. Other than that, it wasn't imaginable. And now it is. So the, the facilities to create these consortiums and teams and to brainstorm ideas is so much larger than it was in the past. 
open access, everybody's putting everything online, articles and data, which we also would have not been available in the past. And even if the, those that are behind a, 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 a wall, a paywall, you can reach out to the everyone, authors and ask them, and they are even more open to sharing because everybody knows we're all, all in this together. And of course, we know we're working online from home. And, and this is, uh, for some, this could be um, a, a challenge because it takes more time, but we can also look at it as a way, an opportunity to grow in time management, to really enjoy our children and to take that break because doing too much work is not good for the brain either. You need the breaks to become more innovative and more creative. So look at it that way. So it's all about how you approach the circumstances. We can't change the circumstances, but we can change how we as people look at it. And to me, the world is so flat today. <laughs> Um, and every region, country, individual is important. I mean, with, with COVID, we have realized that, yes, the West is more advanced in technology and science in some cases and, and in certain sectors. But when we look at the people on the ground, we're all the similar. Uh, people are objecting to wearing masks in the U.S., similar to the, they are in other countries in the East. So we're all in this together. Nobody is better than the other. How can we learn together? How can we work together? And all these power dynamics and barriers are just crumbling away and opening a door for our humanity to do things together. At an individual level, I think we should use our, this time to reflect on our individual capacity. What can we do? Where are our weaknesses? Where are our strengths and work on them? Since we're stuck, we can't go to the lab. Uh, we can't do what we usually do. So refocus the whole strategy of what we wanna do. Take it as a break uh, and find our voice. Start talking, sharing. Uh, you know, usually we're always on the receiving end and not on the giving end in terms of ideas and, and, and uh, 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 just reflections and create our own unique niche to offer to the world. I'm from Jordan. Nobody in the past, said, so what is in Jordan? What is in Jordan that's not in a lab, say, in, in Michigan or in Harvard or in the UK? Oh, there's plenty. And I think COVID-19 uncovered that plenty, the richness, the diversity. Uh, the different ideas and the opportunities. So let's be proud of where we are. Take it and present it to the world and say, hey, I want to work with you. I have something special where I am. I'm special as an individual, where I come from, my community, my culture, the way we're dealing with COVID and so on. And so briefly, I'm going to share four lessons of what I discovered. So I attended a lot of meetings in the Arab world and it just showed me how much potential there is in my region. I don't have to work, look beyond. Uh, I can just look inside in my part of the world and, and uh, help put my hand together with, with these other hands and other people and do something in my region. So we've created a, a consortium of Arab scientists to look at COVID and its impact in the Arab world, which we would have never done before. Um, I'm part of another network of social entrepreneurs. And this has allowed me, just by being in a network online, uh, to meet partners, get ideas, uh, find solutions, uh, again, which I would have never had if, if, if COVID-19 was not around. Uh, as the president of the Society for Advancement of Science and Technology in the Arab world, I've met with all these scientists in diaspora, uh, brainstorming how we can use their potential, their expertise to help scientists in, the, in, in my part of the world. Again, all of, the, all of this came because of COVID. These, are, these were hidden treasures, potentials that no, nobody had uncovered because there was no time, the focus was somewhere else. And lastly, as the uh, head of We Love Reading, which is an organization to encourage children to read for pleasure, we have, it has allowed me to shift my leadership from, from how do I get more funding to make We Love Reading more progressive to putting the whole We Love Reading program for free online for everybody in the world. And so it just, it just from my position, I shifted how I look at the world, resulted in making open access to reach more children all over the world. And all this happened because of COVID. Um, uh, and I urge you to check it out. Now it's online in 10 languages and anybody's welcome to partner with us and work with us. So I also ask you to document and reflect, start a diary for those who we're all at home to start reflecting on our own personal lives and journeys. And then hopefully in the future, these diaries will be published because our generation, uh, the next generation needs to hear our stories so that we become their role models for the future. And to hear our stories from our own uh, pens and pencils and not from somebody else writing about us. So this is an opportunity to write. And somebody, uh, Timothy Winter from Cambridge, called this a global etikaf. And I'm sure many of you know what etikaf is. It's like a strategic retreat uh, where we, we sit and we reflect. We have to do it. it we're compul com it's compulsory. We haven't chosen it. But we can choose to do something good with it. 
And so the positive side, as was mentioned, the family relations, enjoying our children, uh, uh, self-care. And I think most importantly is realizing what people used to say was impossible. We are realizing it's possible in every realm and every sector. People who said you can't work online, we're working online. People said you can't manage, we're managing. Uh, of course, I'm not denying the other side, the uh, stress on mental health, on the economy. We, are, we know these, but people only talk about the negative. We need to talk about the positive. And so post COVID-19, I think we, we, COVID has proven that we can break a lot of these barriers, that they're all flimsy, they're excuses. We need to break them. We need to add quotas. We need to uh, take care of childcare. We need to create more mentoring networks. And this is one we created called Three Circles of Ali Mat. It's also a free online tool to use for female scientists. Um, and most importantly, I think as scientists for research, uh, you know, there's a unique lens that women give to research because of their perspective from where, what they do in life and how they approach life. And this is important and we see it even more now with COVID that we as women can have a unique perspective. We ask unique questions that male would never think about. Um, uh, peer to peer, locally, regionally, and globally. Um, uh, people are listening, Global South, what is your opinion? How are you dealing with these pandemics? Uh, and I'm gonna give an example, many refugees to say, this is not new. We've been dealing with shutdowns and lockdowns. So what can we learn from them who've been going from, through this in the past? Um, and le learning from each other. Uh, and, and one really funny thing is like, we were talking about uh, 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 how women have a unique lens is when, when, I, when I talk about being perseverant and uh, persistent in patients. I remember when I'm having a child and I'm in child labor, how uh, every time I have a contraction, all I have to do is wait for it. Uh, men don't understand that metaphor, but th that metaphor can help in solving a lot of other problems. So there's a lot that women can add. And also the other thing that I learned is science communication. We've used this time, this year, and whatever is left this coming year, is to raise awareness about science in the general population. And we know how important this is for vaccines, for uh, uh, doing healthy practices to prevent the spread of, of COVID. So it is our role as scientists, if we're not in our labs, let's work on science communication. Let's share these simple messages. Let's simplify science and raise awareness. Use this year as a sabbatical, as a retreat to focus on raising the awareness in the community. And that's how we do better science. And that's how we are going to be able to address the grand challenges that we are facing in the 21st century. Interdisciplinary, innovation, teamwork, and having the courage to do it. And, and, and learning from others about other disciplines, not just in our own little uh, silo. So everyone is unique. I think every human being has a unique DNA that will never come, in, has never been in the past, will never come in the future. And so they have something to offer to the world. And if somebody tells you you're just a drop in the ocean, you can tell them, but the ocean is, is what is the ocean made of? Millions of drops. And just to say, I don't preach what I don't say, what I don't do. So I wrote my book, Five Scarves, Doing the Impossible. It's in Arabic and in English. Uh, please read it and tell me what you think. And uh, it's a butterfly effect. Uh, Prophet Muhammad said, do not belittle any good deed. So when a butterfly flutters its wings, it moves the wind one centimeter. There's a hurricane uh, in, t uh, in another place and another time that will have an impact. That's the chaos theory. The world needs us because we are scientists, teachers, artists. We are in all walks of life. We are also the daughters, the wives, the mothers. And above all, we are humans. Humans need to question and be questioned, to think, to share thoughts and emotions, to spread knowledge. We create networks to experience moments, a sense of togetherness, and joy. Three Circles of Alamat exists because humans are determined to make it into this world. So, shall we start? Thank you very much. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Dr. Rana, for the wonderful talk. Um, with this, uh, let's move on to our next speaker. We are running short on time. That's why we'll take questions at the end. 
Uh, we are receiving a few questions in the chat box as well. Uh, let me introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Sumbula Farooq Sheikh. Dr. Sumbula Farooq Sheikh is basically invited to share her perspective as a young woman working in the field of science and technology, engineering and maths. Dr. Sumbula is working at University of Tübingen, uh, Germany. Her work is basically related to uh, primarily focuses on the design and the development of contrast agent for the early detection of cancer with special focus on glioblastoma and prostate carcinoma. With this, I would like request Dr. Sumbula to please start her talk. Thank you so much, Kaziba. A very good day. And um, it was such a, such a wonderful experience listening to all these experienced um, speakers share their experiences and ideas. <clears throat> I have also had a chance to um, observe these things the past, uh, the past year, you know, which was, which was just like, you know, the, the pandemic and nothing was uh, sure what to do, how to do, things were like in chaos. <clears throat> so, I, I mean, the, the talks uh, from my previous uh, speakers, they, they were so comprehensive and wonderful. Um, and actually, I, I can say that my, my talk summarizes what all of them <laughs> explained uh, in their um, presentations. So, <clears throat> COVID pandemic 2020 was a drastic year, we can say. It was like a torrential storm in the lives of people all over the world. Each and every one of us reacted and tried to manage it in accordance with our own capacity to weather down this viral tornado. So to speak, there is a long list of factors such as family and work responsibilities, support that's available and the career stages at which um, career stages which come into play when trying to cope up with this disaster. Because today is the International Women's Day and we're talking specifically about women scientists. So when talking about women scientists who are at various stages, uh, career stages, there, there were pros and there were cons, positives and negatives. Positives such as spending more time with the family, spare time to carry out professional reading. Um, being a scientist myself, a biochemist myself, you know, I, I can understand and I have also gone through this when kids are young and you know, you need the help of everybody, caretakers, kitas, nurseries, everybody to, to take care of them because our, our work, being natural scientist is not just uh, on the computer or reading, it's about working in the labs as well. We have to be in person there. Things, we, we can't do any research if we are not present in our labs, if we are not working in the labs. So, <clears throat> so uh, a positive point would be that we got to spend more time with family, and of course, we, we had a lot of time to uh, improve our professional knowledge by reading the cons, negative. Negative points included, as I explained earlier, not being able to actively do research in the labs because of the lockdown, lack of transport uh, things or problems, various problems that <clears throat> led to the close down of labs or less work in the lab, especially uh, in Germany, because of COVID, uh, you know, these lockdown rules and everything, uh, only a specific number of people um, are assigned to, uh, can be present in a specific square feet measurement. So sometimes we only could, you know, only one, one person could work in the lab and the rest had to stay at home or work in the offices. So these things were a bit of a challenge for all of us. So, it, it hindered a lot. Then what basically, what this forum is about and what yes, all the forums are about. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, Dr. Sumula, we can hear you. Please continue. Okay, okay. 
Now, what we have to do is, and why we are here, we have to focus on how to minimize the negative impacts of COVID-19 outbreak and all these lockdowns uh, for women in science. I personally think, think that there should be training sessions, there should be techniques to develop certain skills as mindfulness exercises, meditational techniques that could relieve the stress, stress that uh, the stress that is caused by all these factors around you. And then, you know, you can, you can ponder, you can think and you can relax, but you need proper training for this probably. I think we should, we should have this as a part of a curriculum or something, something like, like an, a professional training or something. And then this was for the personal individual level, but at macro levels, at macro levels, policy making should be more facilitative and focused on rooting out the gender disparity. Now, my, my colleagues, my seniors already told, uh, discussed about the gender problems and uh, uh, how to, uh, trying to overcome that. But I think it's more about the social circumstances and also it, it has to be induced in the policy making. Because gender disparity is so deep rooted, it's really deep rooted and um, we really have to strive hard to get rid of this. And when we're talking about gender disparity, COVID-19 pandemic has shown and it, it has brought to spotlight the imbalance in imperfections in our society, even the Western society, diversity and inclusive efforts in the workplace in developing countries. And the situation, you know, it, it's like we had these problems in uh, developing developed countries, but we also had the same problem in developing. Uh, I mean, this, this problem maximizes in developing countries. So we need to uh, have remedial measures and we really, really have to have clear cut policy measures to curb this gender in inequality that is induced into, into our systems, wherever. Talk about West, talk about East. It is still there. Women in science, but when we talk about scientists, we, we can't say that we have been spared of this inequality, no. In general also, and in the pandemic also. You know, this, this disparity has always been there and now it has been highlighted because the policy makers are 99% males. So as um, uh, my earlier speaker said, it, they don't know how, how and what a woman goes through um, having kids, taking care of them. They really cannot relate to it. So it's not, you know, they can't think about it. They can't induce all these factors into policy making. The governments, they need to enact policies that ease the negative effects women have experienced in both during the pandemic and after and before the pandemic as well, because these issues need to be discussed. During this crisis, the first people to suffer are women. Why? Because the schools were closed, they were locked down, they had to cook, they had to take care of the household, and then they had to work. Also, they had to see if they publish well, if they publish enough, if their work is, uh, is being carried out, how to manage, how to shuttle. So we have, to, we have to think that the maximum amount of suffering and the maximum number of you know, human race that suffered were women. And we, we really have to put on our gender glasses and try to focus and pinpoint the issues prevailing 
in the present present scenario because we really have to we really have to see what a woman goes through when she's shuttling between her career and her family life and her kids and all these things that are around us now <clears throat> the a main drawback of lockdown due to covid-19 crisis for young women scientists the nurseries were closed schools were closed what to do you know when you have a 1 year old or a 2 years old or a 5 6 years old who has a routine of going to school or being taken care by the daycare center and they're all closed what to do what to do about it has anyone thought about it no up to the covid-19 pandemic till the covid-19 pandemic no one really seriously thought about it and <clears throat> so it's and of course with the pandemic um around us it's even difficult to get, to get random caretakers because you cannot really allow random people now at home you can you cannot have really that kind of social interaction that was possible before the covid-19 pandemic and all and this the biggest problem this is this was the biggest problem and it really magnified all the existing problems violence um disruption of the uh, of the whole social system taking care of the families um the balance of uh, work between the you know between all the family members because you know everything got disrupted and when we when we think about this we can see that the female scientists they their their positions were really at risk they suffered a lot many of them who were not at full positions or who were working part time had to leave their jobs because they could not manage the hours full time working um, female researchers working absolutely because of their family responsibilities probably had to take a break or something and you know this led this led to a chain of uh, crisis and financial economical social you know all these things really um, became a big package drawbacks of the covid-19 pandemic what we need to do is we need to bring about broad changes in the policies we need to think about it the policy makers have to think about it have to they they have to focus they have to put that magnifying glass on uh, look with a magnifying glass what a woman goes through all the professional women and especially in the field of science you know like us who work in the laboratories all day you know we we need to we need support and um we have to think that these policies should include extensions and in grants parental leave extension other supplement grants for women to cope up with such crisis and they also need to have um flexible hours they, their work should be adapted according to their family responsibilities and then these were we this we were talking about family Uh, challenges and then there are career challenges what to do about career challenges you have to publish you have to work and then you have to take care of your family how to juggle all this how to juggle and then this really led to drastic drastic changes in lives of many many women scientists so what 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 should be done global networks should be organized to help women scientists think through their career strategies during this time journals should have specific quotas for women scientists who publish who want to publish 
reviewers should be a most uh, you know at least every journal should have a group of women reviewers there should be a quota for women scientists for publishing papers so these measures should be taken to facilitate the career challenges women have and we can also support early career researchers and how to uh, how to manage efficiently their work how to think about new ideas how to discuss how to discuss their uh, their research how to broaden their perspective and um, for this purpose webinars virtual meetings should be regularly conducted and it should be a part of the of the whole setup and uh, these meetings they should be free of charge there should be no charge because making them free of charge would increase the accessibility everyone then can take part in that you know they can benefit from them and financial burden will be lessened because you know at this point if you are you are taking care of your children and you're taking care of your families and then you are at one point you know struggling for your job for the grants then it's difficult uh, for a woman to spare extra money for these webinars and all these things can you hear me because i can hear myself is uh, there yes, some doctor, problem no no doctor somala oh. we can uh, okay. we can hear you properly but okay. i would request okay. you to please um, you know just if you can kindly wrap up in 2 minutes so that we can take yes, your question yes 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 i will i will do that thank so, you thank you just two liners what i would like i would like to summarize this that researchers and academics who never engaged in policy making they should be a part of policy makers they should be the policy makers it's a very daunting step because we all love to be in the lab and we all love to read but we should also think that we should be part of the policy makers we should be the policy makers so um, because academics academia can only understand what especially women can only under they can only understand what they go through so i would my suggestion is that we should involve ourselves into policy maker making and make life better for women scientists and help them um help them grow thank you so much thank you dr sumala thank you <clears throat> uh with us uh, we are open for question and answers um i would like to request my audience to please ask question and please mention who you asking for this question from or is it open to everybody all of our speakers so let me ask this question which uh, has been posted in the chat box uh, this is uh, to dr rana dijani uh, from dr zahid hussain he is saying that you have shown curb showing difference between men and women regarding education job and career um, would you please tell patron in western world asia and in the particular among muslim community dr rana i i didn't quite understand the question Uh, show the differences between what? Sorry, so I think he's basically asking for uh, from a slide that he showed, where you showed that you know uh, women in your part of the world, like Jordan, they were graduating sixty percent in the STEM fields, uh, which is comparable to West to other developed world. He's asking for stats in the Asian countries and uh, particularly among the Muslim countries. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Uh, uh, i can um, uh, advise you to go to the resource so if you go to unesco uh, and and go to per country uh, uh, breakdown of the percentage of male female in stem fields at different levels of education uh, you can get an uh, you can get a um, 
a, 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 an inkling of the differences, the di diversity, uh, because in the West, it's not 60%, it's, it's 30%, right? Uh, Europe as well. But then when you come to Jordan, the Arab world, it's 60%, right? But when you do the average, <laughs> Everybody thinks, oh, the average, the lower must be in the developing and the highest must be in the developed. But it's actually not, not so for, for education. So go to the UNESCO website or even in your own country. And if there's no statistics, this is uh, one thing that can be done is to gather those numbers and post them so the world knows. And we're not saying that we don't have problems, we do. It's just that we want to understand what are the real problems we have and work on them rather than borrowing a problem from somewhere else and working on it when it's really not our problem. Thank you, Dr. Rana. So there are two questions which are uh, in the vein of, you know, how to change mindset of people um, in general and particularly to uh, other gender, the male, uh, who, who can support women in science. So I would like to have your input from Dr. Rana Dajani as well as from Tim uh, Anwin. Uh, so how can we actually change attitudes? What are the research showing us in this area? Uh, I'll go and then uh, if uh, Professor Tim wants to, uh, uh, with his tips, which are really amazing. I, th I, want, I can't wait to go read them. Uh, from my side, it's about uh, role models. So uh, role models among men as well. So we, the stereotype in the media keeps talking about males. Uh, and they only highlight the negative stories. Uh, and what we know, each one of us, each female scientist has a, a, a male who has been supporting her one way or the other. But we don't tell those stories. And so the rhetoric becomes everything is negative. So we need to uh, capture that by sharing those positive stories. And then that becomes the trend and the role model for the growing males and the growing females. In the community. So that's one tip. And I'll leave the rest. Of you. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Tim. I could speak for hours on this, but I think the, the key things I'd say is it has to be a systemic change. There's not one solution fits all, mm -hmm. lots of little. So you start with boys in the school, and, and so we've, we've got a guide on how we can, we can help boys become aware. Um, there, there are structural things, and much of this discussion has been at the high policy level. In my experience, even in countries where one might say women are most oppressed, the, the, some of the strongest patriarchal countries. I think men in leadership, many of them, I, I accept not all, but many are open. They just need to have their, their mind shifted. So having uh, discussions, get, having it in the media, the more we can do at every level, um, we can make a difference. And I, there's one sad dimension. There's, there's one part of the world where some of my team are based uh, where men are excluded from any discussions about gender and, and women. The women actually exclude them. Um, and, and I think that's actually quite sad because we've got this polarized views. And as I think several of us were saying, you know, the attitudes in the West on which much global policy is determined um, are not necessarily the same as apply in Malaysia or in the Arabian Peninsula or in Pakistan. And, and the cultural specificity is really important. We must understand that. I could talk for hours, but I'm conscious of the time, Shazima. I, I just yes. like to say how much I enjoyed everybody else's presentation. Really inspiring. Uh, just one quick question, which has been posted in our chat box. So I would like request Dr. Khadija to please comment on this. Uh, our participant, Ms. Kainat, is asking, how can we women earn more money who are working in the STEM fields? So um, do we have any suggestion from Dr. Khadija in this department? Well, I was just doing in the chat box just that during this COVID-19, I, can you hear me? I'm having yes, problems. Yes. Uh, what, what I found is that some of my students are having, uh, what they did was they made hand sanitizers. And because they are microbiology students, they even checked on the effectiveness of the hand sanitizers and they started to sell those. So you, you have got to be thinking about what to do and improvise and get on with life. Yeah. I've got friends right. who have uh, based on their, um, their inventions, they've made creams, creams for the face, for... And they start to sell those, yeah. 
from the right. PhD. Right, right. So, basic, so with this, uh, just one quick, one more quick question from the audience. Do we have a question? Yes, I have a question. Please uh, go ahead. Um, Dr. Aitana Sadova, I'm general surgeon. During this pandemic, uh, I couldn't publish my uh, articles. Um, now I'm getting PhD education. Uh, can you give an advice about uh, this problem? Uh, how can I publish my articles with uh, in journals with high impact? Have you any advice for me? So who do you want you to answer this? To all lecturers and uh, give advice. Uh, okay, I can get great. it. Right. So Dr. Rana? Okay, I'll jump in. Uh, first of all, publishing is always not an easy path. So it's, it's not just because of COVID, right? If you're just a PhD student now, as you mentioned, uh, it, it takes persistence, it takes time. Uh, you, you keep submitting, you start, you make a list of journals, you go with the highest impact, and then you keep going down, learning from each review, and you improve your uh, research article. And then ultimately you will publish, but you have to put as part of your expectation that you're going to be, uh, uh, your article will not be published in the probably uh, in the first journal you submit to. Uh, although it may happen, you never know. It's, but that's the hallmark of a scientist. Persistence, never giving up, um, never taking no for an answer, and learning, every time learning. Could, could, could I follow that? I, I agree completely with uh, Professor Rana. I, I would just make two, two other observations. One is, in science, we have multi-authorship. Uh, different disciplines have different policies for which order the authors go in but I have very clear empirical evidence across the board that even there, gender influences it. You know, if you have a, you know, young men from certain parts of the world are very aggressive about getting their name you know, first rather than second, um, and, 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 or even last. Actually, there are some disciplines where being the last named author is actually at the strongest place because it means you've directed the research. So I, I, I think even in publishing, there's that bias and, and that needs to be really rooted out. So it needs you know, the men to, to tell their colleagues to just not do it. I, I'm going to be very naughty though and say, actually nobody reads most academic publications. So if you want to have your research having greatest impact, set up your own blog, do all sorts of alternative things. I mean, I've almost stopped publishing because Peer review system is a game. You can play it, but uh, okay, yes, you need it. You can build your own but there is so much corruption in peer review. It, it's unbelievable. Okay, can I add? Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Tim. Uh, with this, uh, we are going thank to conclude you. this session, panel discussion for today. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists today, Dr. Tim Anwin, Dr. Khadija Yusuf, Dr. Rana Dajani and Dr. Sumbala Farooq Sheikh. And with this, we are also very grateful to our participants who remained with us for uh, one, in one hour and 30 minutes. And all of you will receive your e-certificates. And uh, with this, we would uh, like to say bye-bye and khuda to you all and a very good day to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Fazeeza. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Thank all. You, Thank you, Dr. Sumbala. Thank you.